as a magic place. Four peaks lined the centre of the island. Two of them were active volcanoes. Only the bravest natives dared live on Vanikoro, and they were the last to give up cannibalism. As the small boat drew near the island, Bloody Mary pointed at Vanikoro and assured Cable, You like, you like very much. The marines studied the volcanoes. Upon them, the red glow of sunrise rapidly lightened into the gold of early morning. Mists rose from them like smoke from writhing lava. Cable watched the mists of Vanikoro surrendering to the early sun, and then, as a child, while playing with an old familiar toy, sees a new thing from the corner of his eye, Cable suddenly saw, without looking at it, the island of Valley High. There was another island. Valley High was an island of the sea a jewel of the vast ocean. It was small, like a jewel. It could be perceived in one loving glance. It was neat. It had majestic cliffs facing the open sea. It had a jagged hill to give it character. It was green like something ever youthful, and it seemed to curve itself like a woman into the rough shadows formed by the volcanoes on the greater island of Vanikoro. From two miles distance, no seafarer could have guessed that Palihai existed. Like most lovely things, one had to seek it out, and even to know what one was seeking before it could be found. And so, James Michener, in his travels of the South Pacific Islands gives us an insight to the mystique of the island of Vanikoro. No doubt ignited or even heightened by stories of La Perouse's last voyage. One of the last letters known to have been written by La Perouse before he departed upon his circumnavigation in August 1785, and from which he was never to return. addressed to me in Brest, did not reach Paris until 18th of June, and by the time my reply is delivered to you in Corsica, I will have departed Brest. Please accept my regrets for the delays which have made it impossible to accept your proposal, and be assured of my appreciation. I have the honour, monsieur, to be your most humble and obedient servant, La Perouse. La Perouse was born in 1741 near Arby to a noble family. He studied in a Jesuit college joined the Navy as Garde Marine in Brest on 19th of November 1756 at the age of 15. In 1757, during the Seven Years' War, he served aboard the ship Celebre in an expedition to the fort of Louisbourg in New France and North America, and again in 1758 to Louisbourg. This fort had been under siege, and his expedition 
was forced to make a circuitous route around Newfoundland to avoid the British warships. La Perouse fought on the side of the French during the American Revolution as well as in India against British and Portuguese. In December 1781, La Perouse escorted a convoy to the West Indies. There he participated in the attack on St. Kitts in February 1782, and also fought in the defeat of the Battle of the Saint against the squadron of Admiral Rodney. In August 1782 he captured two English forts, Prince of Wales and York, on the coast of Hudson Bay, but he allowed the survivors, including Governor Samuel Hearn of Prince of Wales, to sail to England in exchange for a promise to release French prisoners held there. In 1783, he succeeded in gaining his family's consent to marry the young Creole Louise Eleanor Brudeau whom he had met eight years earlier on Ile de France in Mauritius. In 1759, serving aboard Formidable, La Perouse was wounded in the Battle of Quiberon Bay off the south coast of Brittany. He was captured and imprisoned before being paroled back to France in December 1760. Later, he participated in an attempt by the French to gain control of Newfoundland and in 1762 escaped with the fleet when the British arrived. In 1778, at the outbreak of the Anglo-French War, La Perouse was given command of the 32-gun frigate Amazon. On 7th of October 1779, he captured the 20-gun HMS Ariel, a name known to those who read the Jack Aubrey novels of Patrick O'Brien. La Perouse was then promoted to captain on 4th April 1780. On the 2nd of May of that year, he took part in the Expedition Particulière under Admiral Ternay to the Caribbean. He then transferred to Astrée in the summer of 1781, where he was offered the 50-gun Sagittaire when he requested to keep his command of Astrée. He was appointed to lead a frigate division along with Hermione under La Touche Treville in 1785. King Louis the Sixteenth of France and his Secretary of State of the Navy, the Marquis de Castry, appointed La Perouse to lead an expedition of discovery called La Perouse Expedition and commanded by the same after La Perouse's extensive experience sailing, he departed from Brest on the 1st of August, 1785. The purpose of his expedition was to conduct an exploration in the Pacific Ocean to complement the work of the British sailor and explorer James Cook, who had charted the east coast of Australia, as well as Venus transit across the sun in his 1770 voyage aboard Endeavour, and even La Perouse should circumnavigate the globe, stopping at Alaska, California, the Hawaii.
Hawaiian Islands, Australia, the seas of China and Japan, and the many islands of the Pacific. To correct and complete maps of the area, establish trade contacts, and open new maritime routes, and enrich French science and scientific collections. For ships, La Perouse was to have l'astrolabe under Fleuriot Le Langle and La Boussole, both of 500 tons. Originally store ships, they had been reclassified as frigates for the voyage. These were to send back reports via existing European routes and outposts in the Pacific. As early as March 1785, La Perouse sent the expedition's chief engineer to London in order to find out about the anti-scurvy measures recommended by Captain written about by Joseph Banks, as well as to exchange items used by Cook in his dealings with native peoples, and to buy scientific instruments of English manufacture. Joseph Banks, Cook's botanist and diarist, intervened at the Royal Society in order to obtain for Monoran, the chief engineer of La Perouse, two inclining compasses that had belonged to Captain Cook, furnished with a list produced by Jean-Pierre Claret de Fleurieux. Scientific instruments were also procured from some of the largest English firms, as well as the acquisition of two sextants of a new type. La Perouse was very capable and well liked by his men. Among his crew were ten scientists, an astronomer and a mathematician, a geologist, a botanist, a physicist, three naturalists, and three illustrators, as well as two chaplains who had been scientifically schooled. On a curious note, one of the young men who had applied to join this expedition was the 16-year-old Corsican Napoleon Bonaparte, at the time a second lieutenant from Paris's military academy. However, he missed the selection. What would have happened to the world history had he been chosen for this ill-fated voyage remains conjecture. La Perouse's scientists would base their calculations of longitude on precision chronometers and on the distance between the moon and the sun, followed by theodolite triangulations, bearings taken from the ship, the same as those taken by Cook to produce his maps of the Pacific and its islands. From this voyage, resolving the problem of longitude became evident, and mapping had attained a scientific precision. Let's travel along with La Perouse and see his ports of call. He left Brest with 220 men on the 1st of August 1785, rounded Cape Horn, and from there investigated the Spanish colonial government in the Captaincy General of Chile. Arriving on 9th of April 1786, 
Lakes on Easter Island, La Perouse then sailed on to the Sandwich Islands, present day Hawaii, where he became the first European to set foot on the island of Maui. From Hawaii, La Perouse sailed to Alaska, where he landed near Mount St. Elias in late June 1786. On the 13th of July of that year, a barge and two long boats carrying 21 men were lost in the heavy currents of the bay called Port des Français by La Pérouse and known now as Lituya Bay. From there, the expedition headed south, exploring the northwest coast and outer islands of present-day British Columbia. Progressing south, La Peru sailed to the Spanish Las Californias province. He stopped at the Presidio of San Francisco, long enough to create an outline map of the Bay Area, Plan du Port de Saint-François, situé sur la côte de la Californie septentrionale. He arrived in Monterey Bay, and at the Presidio of Monterey on the 14th of September 1786 visiting Spanish settlements, ranches, and missions, and also making very critical notes on the Franciscan missionary treatment of the indigenous peoples of California. La Perouse was the first non-Spanish visitor to California since Francis Drake in 1579. From Las Californias, La Perouse again crossed the Pacific Ocean, arriving at Macau in just 100 days. There, he sold furs that he had acquired in Alaska, and divided the profits among his men after a visit to Manila in April 1787. He set out for the Northeast Asian coasts, including modern-day South Korea. La Perouse then sailed northward to Okoyesu Island, Russia. The Ainu people drew him a map showing their second domain of Yezo Island, present-day Hokkaido, Japan. coasts of Tartary, Russia, on mainland Asia. La Perouse wanted to sail north through the narrow strait of Tartary between Okuyesu Island and mainland Asia. But this endeavor failed. Turning south, he sailed east through La Perouse Strait between Okuyeso Island and Yezo, or Hokkaido. There he met more Ainu in their third domain of the Kuril Islands. From the Kuril, La Perouse sailed north, reaching Petropavlovsk on the Russian Kamchatka Peninsula on 7th of September 1787. Here they enjoyed the hospitality of the Russians and the Kamchatkins. They received mail in which letters from Paris ordered La Perouse to investigate the settlement the British were establishing in New South Wales. It is this port at which La Perouse and his crew were able to dispatch much of their correspondence. Barthélemy de Lesseps, son of the French vice-consul at Kronstadt in Russia, 
who had joined the ex expedition as an interpreter, disembarked in Petropavlovsk to bring the expedition's ship's logs, charts, and letters to France, which he did, and also which entailed a year-long epic journey across Siberia and Russia, and is an adventurous tale in itself. La Perouse's next stop was the Navigator Islands, modern-day Samoa, on 6th December 1787. Just before he left, the Samoans attacked a group of his men, killing twelve, among whom was de Langle, commander of l'Astrolabe, leaving twenty men wounded. The expedition then drifted to Tonga for resupply and aid. Later, they found the Ile Plistar and Norfolk Island. From there, they continued to Australia, arriving in Botany Bay on 24th of January, 1788. There, La Perouse encountered the British convoy, now known historically as the First Fleet, led by Captain Arthur Phillip, whom you might remember is buried at Bathampton, and who was to establish the penal colony of New South Wales. This fleet consisted of eleven ships of convicts, guards, and settlers that were to establish the colony that would be located at Botany Bay. Captain Philip had determined that the site was unsuitable and the colony would instead be established at Sydney Cove in Port Jackson on the Parramatta River, the site of the present-day Sydney Harbour. The same high winds which had hindered La Perouse's ships in entering Botany Bay delayed Captain Phillip's relocation until the 26th of January, which is now commemorated as Australia Day. The French expedition was received courteously, and they spent six weeks at the British colony. This was to be their last recorded landfall. While La Perouse and Captain Philip did not meet, French and British officers visited each other formally on several occasions and offered each other assistance and supplies. The senior French officer to visit Sydney Cove and wait upon Governor Philip was Robert Sutton de Clonard, the succeeding and much-loved captain of the Astrolabe, who took dispatches to him for forwarding to the French ambassador in London by the returning transport Alexander. During the six-week stay, the French expedition established an observatory and a garden, held a mass, and made geological observations. La Perouse also took this opportunity to send his journals, charts, and letters back to Europe. This letter, written by the Comte de La Perouse, just before his departure from Botany Bay would be his last. Despite numerous searches and expeditions during almost a century and a half to find his remains, his disappearance remains today enigmatic. On the 10th of March, after taking on wood and fresh water, the expedition left New South Wales, bound for New Caledonia.
Caledonia, Santa Cruz, the Solomons, the Louisiade, and the western and southern coasts of Australia. While La Perouse had reported in a letter from Port Jackson that he expected to be back in France by June 1789, neither he nor any members of his expedition were seen again by Europeans. Documents that had been relayed to France from La Perouse's expedition were published in Paris in 1797 under the title Voyage de la Perouse au Tour du Monde. King Louis had been desperate to hear of the fate of La Perouse, since no further news had been forthcoming. And, on the 25th of September, 1791, Rear Admiral Bruni d'Entrecasteau departed Brest in search of La Perouse in the lost expedition. Entrecasteau followed La Perouse's proposed path through the islands northwest of Australia, while at the same time making his own scientific and geographic discoveries. This expedition consisted of the ships Recherche and Espérance. In May 1793, Entre Castel sighted Santa Cruz, now part of the Solomons, and another uncharted island to the southeast. This island was Vanikoro. This French expedition did not approach Vanikoro, only recording it on their charts before sailing away to explore the other Solomon Islands further. Two months later, Andre Casteau died. His botanist, Jacques La Pilladière, attached to the expedition, returned to France and published his account, Relation de Voyage à la Recherche de la Perouse, in 1800. Legend has it that Louis the Sixteenth, as he was mounting the scaffolds before his execution, in 1793, uttered these last words, Attends des nouvelles de Monsieur de La Perouse. Is there any news of La Perouse? Needless to say, Franco-British relations, which had not been the best throughout the century, deteriorated further during the French Revolution and rumours spread in France, blaming the British for the tragedy which had occurred in the vicinity of the new colony of New South Wales. Before the mystery was even close to being solved, the French government published the records of the voyage as far as Kamchatka, Voyage de la Perouse autour du monde, published in Paris in 1797 in four volumes. These volumes are still used today for cartographic and scientific information about the Pacific. Three English translations were published from 1798 to 99. In 1825, Thomas Manby of the Royal Navy brought a report, supported by presumptive evidence, that the spot where the intrepid La Perouse had perished forty years earlier with his brave crew had now been ascertained. An English whaler discovered a long and low island surrounded by innumerable breakers, situated between New Caledonia and New Guinea and at nearly equidistant from each of these islands. The inhabitants came on board the whaler, and one of the chiefs had a cross of St. Louis hanging as an ornament from one of his 
ears. Some of the natives had swords on which the word Paris was engraved, and others had medals of Louis the Sixteenth. One chief, about fifty years old, told the story that when he was young, a large ship was wrecked in a violent gale on a coral reef. During his voyage around the world, Manby had seen several medals of Louis the Sixteenth, which La Perouse had distributed in California. And La Perouse, when he had departed Botany Bay, also intimated that he intended to steer from the northern part of New Holland or Australia and explore the Solomon's Archipelago. However, it was not until 1826 that an Irish sea captain, Peter Dillon, found enough evidence to piece together some of the events of the tragedy that befell the Boussole and Lastrolebe. One of the islands of the Santa Cruz group, Ticopia, Dylan bought some swords that he had reason to believe had belonged to La Perouse or some of his officers. Dylan made enquiries and found that they came from nearby Vanicor where two big ships had broken up years earlier. Dylan managed to obtain a ship in Bengal and sailed for the coral atoll of Vanikoro. There he found cannonballs, anchors, and other evidence of the remains of ships in the water between the coral reefs. One of the natives showed Dylan and his crew the direction to sail to get to Vanikoro. Dylan bought several of the artifacts that had been shown to him and brought them with him back to Europe. These artifacts that had been procured from the natives of La Perouse's expedition were brought back by Dylan as well as to Monterville in 1828, and a number of explorers looking for the La Perouse expedition. Lesseps, the only member of the original expedition still alive at the time, who you remember trekked across Siberia, identified these objects as all belonging to Lastrolebe. information that the natives of Vangenkoro gave to Dylan enabled a rough reconstruction to be made of the disaster that struck La Perouse's ships. Subsequent examination of this site in 1964 and of what was believed to be the shipwreck of the Boussole confirmed Dylan's reconstruction. Another expedition took place in 2005. This expedition embarked aboard Jacques Cartier, a French Navy ship, with a team of multidisciplinary scientists assembled to investigate the mystery of La Perouse. This mission was named Operation Vanicoro. Sur les traces des épaves de la Perouse. Another mission in 2008 was taken from France in conjunction with the New Caledonian Association Salomon to seek more answers about La Perouse's mysterious and enigmatic fate. This 2008
2008 expedition brought together more technological resources than previously and involved two ships, 52 crew members and almost 30 scientists and researchers. The French Navy ships set out on 16th of September 2008 for Vanikoro from Noumea in New Caledonia. They arrived on the 15th of October, thus recreating a section of La Perouse's final voyage undertaken more than 200 years ago. Both ships had been wrecked on Vanikoro's reefs. Astrolab wrecked second was unloaded and taken apart. A group of men, probably the survivors of Boussol, were massacred by the local inhabitants. According to the islanders, some surviving sailors built a two-masted craft from the wreckage of Astrolab and left in a westward direction about nine months later. But what happened to them remains unknown. Two men, one of them a chief and the other his servant, had remained behind, but had left Vanikoro a few years before Dylan arrived. We can assume this was either an officer or one of the captains. In November 1790, it is said that a certain Captain Edward Edwards, in command of HMS Pandora, had sailed from England with orders to comb the Pacific for the mutineers of the bounty. In March of the following year, Pandora arrived at Tahiti and picked up 14 bounty crewmen who had stayed on that island. Although some of the 14 had not joined the mutiny, all were imprisoned and shackled in a cage that was put on deck. Pandora then left Tahiti in search of bounty, and the leader of the mutiny, Fletcher Christian, whose descendants we can read about also in James Michener. Captain Edwards' search for the remaining mutineers ultimately proved fruitless. However, when passing Vanikoro on 13th of August 1791, he is said to have observed smoke signals rising from the island. Edwards, ruthless, single-minded in his search for the bounty, and convinced that mutineers fearful of discovery would not be advertising their whereabouts, ignored the smoke signals and sailed on. These smoke signals were believed to be almost certainly a distress signal sent by the survivors of the La Perouse expedition, which later evidence indicated were still alive on Vanikoro at that time three years after Boussol and Astrolab had foundered. The story of Pandora itself is a long one and fraught with mischance. She foundered on the Great Barrier Reef to great loss of life and she was never salvaged. Let's visit the Maritime Museum 
in Nubea, New Caledonia. Noting the different ways to write the name of La Perouse and how La Perouse signed his letters himself, the Academy now favours two words, La and Perouse, as standard. The national treasure, the La Perouse collection, and this website is share these photos and make them available to the public. There are some 360 artifacts, the most significant of those discovered on land in Vanikoro and at the sites where the vessels under the orders of Comte de la Perouse were shipwrecked and vanished in 1788 into the immensity of the Pacific Ocean. This website proposes to be a gateway for all researchers and historians who are interested in the greatest French expedition of the 18th century, an expedition steeped in history. There are over 4,600 record cards in the collection each representing a single object, whether whole or fragmented, and they all now belong to the French national collections. The remains of the La Perouse expedition discovered in Panicoro are objects that have their own story to tell, of the men who owned and used them. They provide their contribution to our understanding of this tragedy, and they are the cornerstones in this extraordinary investigation, which has been in progress for over two centuries, fueling dreams and triggering emotions, these artifacts exhibited in the museum are and will continue to be for generations to come evidence of the sacrifice of these 220 sailors and scientists who set sail from Brest one day in 1785 in an attempt to understand and explain the world. This describes the beginning of the expedition on 1st of August 1785. The last great discovery expedition in France's history. After three years of exploration, the vessels vanished with all hands. The website says that it is hard not to draw a parallel between the woeful end to the expedition and the fate of its royal instigator, King Louis the Sixteenth. This tells about La Perouse's naval history and experience and his friendship with the English naval mariners. Here are some of his navigational instruments and tools medical and scientific observation equipment, as well as marine chronometers. They were the most advanced for their time, according to the last news received from the expedition sent on 10th of March, 1788. The ships had already covered around 40,000 nautical miles in 690 days at sea interspersed with 266 days of stopovers. Looking at the two ships, Astrolabe and Boussole, they were two cargo 
ships, and they were chosen over faster and more easily maneuverable vessels, 500 ton scows, about 42 meters long, and 8.8 meters wide, with a draft of about four and a half meters. The Astrolabe had been built in Le Havre in 1782, and Boussol was built in Bayonne in 1783, designed by Jean Joseph Chinou. This tells about the work that had been done to them to prepare them for the expedition. Half of the ports were fitted to all gun ports to prevent against rough seas. New galleys were fitted and six-pounder cannons placed on board each vessel. And this is what we saw in the archaeological expedition Breen brought to the surface. And this tells about the staff and crew, the Comte d'Hector and Vicomte de Langle personally supervised the recruitment of the crew for the frigates. They chose hardy, experienced sailors with additional skills, such as carpenters, tailors and cobblers. The contracts offered were very attractive for the time and setting off on this prestigious expedition was both an honour and a promise of substantial revenue. Almost all of the sailors selected were Breton. This ensured crew cohesion, but also had other motives, revealed by a letter from Comte d'Hector to the minister, Castri. The Bretons are the most suitable for campaigns such as this. Their strength, character, and their lack of concern for the future make them the preferential choice. There were several scientists on board. The Academy of Sciences and the Society of Medicine were called upon to establish a program following the guidelines determined by the king and his ministers. According to a report, La Perouse and his team were being invited by the king to perform astounding astronomical, ethnological, botanical, archaeological, geographical, and nautical inventories. These surveys were to be systematic, even when previous explorers had already made investigations. They had, for instance, aerostatic balloons that were used to determine the wind direction, as well as a number of instruments that were cutting edge for the day. Never before this expedition had such attention been given to scientific matters. Despite the conditions in these damp ships, almost no lives were lost due to illness after three years at sea, indicating that the officers and scholars had worked to the best of their abilities to prevent sea seagoing illnesses. This covers the journey from Brest to Hawaii. And they stop off at Easter Island. And from Hawaii to Las Californias. This tells about the tragedy with the longboats. At 10 a.m. La Perouse saw that the boat commanded by Monsieur Boutin had returned and he was told of the tragedy driven by the current the 
Usa's longboat became positioned across the passage and capsized with the first wave. The other Biscayan longboat, commanded by La Borde de Marchainville, was out of danger by then. Yet, as the second crew attempted to rescue their comrades, they suffered the same fate. As for the small jolly boat, it made a safe escape thanks to the experienced Boutin, who had faced his stern post into the current and was pushed out of the bay on the crest of a wave. La Perouse, it is said, was particularly distraught by this tragic incident, as it had led to the loss of two sons of the Marquis. Jean-Joseph de Laborde, court banker and friend of La Perouse. Twenty-one sailors were lost here. Here they obtained sea otter skins and some American Indian objects. Many American Indian objects that they had collected during this stopover included stone mallets, parts of harpoons and hooks, and a pierced bear tooth, and a pestle in the shape of a manatee, all found in Vanicoro. From California to Macau, this was the 100-day sail across the Pacific, and the artist Duchet de Vinci painted views across the city of Macau. Macau to Kamchatka. So they went from the Macau to the Philippines and arrived in Kamchatka, Russia, and thence they made their way to Australia, and then in Botany Bay they anchored on the evening of the 23rd of January, 1788. The English fleet was set to move to Cove Bay, now known as Sydney Cove, identified as an excellent mooring place by Captain Philip, when suddenly, to their great amazement, there, at the end of the earth, a white sail appeared on the horizon, immediately followed by a second, La Perouse's frigates. By 1789, the scheduled date set by La Perouse for the expedition's arrival in the Ile de France, Mauritius, had been and gone, and rumours were rife. The king and the people of France were concerned about the sailors' fate. Triggered by a petition addressed by the Natural History Society of Paris, the National Assembly, also troubled by the fate, of La Perouse and his crew adopted a decree on 9th February 1791 calling for the king to fit out one more ship aboard which shall be found scholars, naturalists, draftsmen and to charge the commanders of the expedition with the twofold mission of searching for Monsieur de La Perouse and conducting research in the fields of science and trade the commander would be Bruni d'Entrecasteau. Marine and submarine searches over the 200 years identify how the vessels foundered and sank. One day or night in May or June 1788, at the end of this austral summer, 
In unstable sea and weather conditions, the ships were coming dangerously close to an island, no doubt pushed by what are known as the Westerlies in the South Pacific. The faster of the two frigates, the Astrolabe, noticed breaking waves and managed to sail upwind while firing cannon shots to warn the boussole of the danger. However, the boussole, which was less easily maneuverable, was unable to flee the danger. Despite desperate attempts, she veered, steered clear of, then violently struck her stern on a fault in the reef, where breaking waves swept over the remains of the ship. The astrolabe was not out of danger either. While attempting to keep heading north, she grounded on the reef several times, damaging her hull, which began to take on water. The helmsman then indicated what looked like a passage to enter and shelter in the lagoon, their last chance. However, it was a false passage, far too narrow for this large ship which became definitively stranded. It is nevertheless likely that the grounding of the astrolabe left more survivors than the sinking of the boussole. And now we have what happened to the collections, not only of the things that La Perouse sent back, but what was recovered of his expedition. And Vanicoro, the southernmost of the Santa Cruz Islands, part of the Solomon Islands archipelago, it is the second largest island of the Santa Cruz group with a surface area of 190 kilometers and an altitude of around 900 meters. The closest island, Utapua, is located 30 kilometers northwest. Tikopia is the furthest island in the group, some 230 kilometers to the southeast. Vanikoro is a volcanic island composed of three cones and surrounded by a barrier reef protecting a particularly deep lagoon, around one and a half kilometers wide. Vanikoro has a mean annual rainfall at seawater level of between 5.6 and 7.9 meters. The inhabitants of Vanikoro are Melanesian, settled in a few scattered villages they use the south coast for fishing and gardening, but do not occupy it as it is too humid. At the time of the shipwreck, Tikopians regularly visited Vanikoro, and it even appears that some had already settled on this island. These people of Polynesian origin were constantly seeking new lands to colonize and the shipwreck may have given them the chance to settle long term. The inner part of the island is composed of basalt soils and covered with a tropical rainforest. The majority of the coastline is lined with high mangrove trees growing in marshy ground. Vanikoro is surrounded by a nearly uninterrupted belt of coral reef to the north West and south, the fringing reef extends across one to two miles. Quite a short distance from the coast, passes reaching out in front of the wide rivers open the lagoon up to visitors coming from the sea. More expeditions. And the underwater archaeological sites. And the finds of one of the mariners, the unknown mariner of Vanikoro. After initial analysis on the site, the bones were transported to France and examined by the Arc Antique Laboratory. 
investigations indicated that the victim was between 33 and 35 years old. He had excellent dental hygiene, was slightly prognostous, and had worn teeth, which suggested he was in the habit of chewing. Therefore, it is estimated these bones do not belong to the Comte de la Perruse. Conjecture as it, it could have been the astronomer Le Pote Dragelet, given that the, all the objects found in the font point to either Abbe Manger, a crucifix, small box of holy oils, a porcelain altar stone, or Dagelet, an astronomical telescope, a quadrant, and other observation instruments. Yet further analysis, revising the age of the unknown mariner between 30 and 32 years, could lead the investigation in the direction of the assistant surgeon of the Boussole, Jacques-Joseph Lecoeur. Here's the archaeology of the French camp on uh, Vanegoro that Dylan found. relics and artifacts from La Perouse's time in New Caledonia. And here we have Le Mystère de La Perouse. The sudden and complete disappearance of the ships and their crew in 1788 formed a veil of mystery around this great expedition. If the frigates had not grounded on this volcano surrounded by coral, who would have heard of the island of Vanikoro today? If there had been survivors, what had been their fate? So far from their homeland, in the immensity of the South Pacific. Not 
specialist and doctor, almost like uh, Stephen in the Aubrey Maturin series, and Monsieur de Lesseps and his uncle, Monsieur Provos. We also have a um, navigator, right, or a cartographer. was in royal service as Cardinal of Versailles and Abbe Morche and he is publisher of the Journal de Physique so probably a phys physician and uh, the incredible journey of the boussole and astrolabe Sixteenth, and his maps, dreaming about exploration and advancing France's place in the world. Paris, Captain Cook in Australia. Seven Years' War. So we go through a little bit of La Perouse's service history before we come to the departure of La Boussole and Astrolabe. equipment, provisions, look at that, plants, books, that looks like perhaps a carronade, carronade, and you can see in the port, La Perouse writes his last letter. adventurous voyage away from civilization with a very capable crew of many learned men and the French coat of arms for Louis the Sixteenth. The land disappears behind them and they see whales and the long voyage the sailors entertain themselves at sea and here they are stopping off in South America I think yes and they're very well received and you can see the ladies with their fans and combs Chile, Easter Island, stopping to look at geological, anthropological, biological, and all kinds of flora and fauna, everything they can observe to further the world's knowledge of what is in the Pacific. are the people of far, far north, North America, they're in the Alaskan um, Aleutians, and this is where La Perouse lost a jolly boat, or his sailors did. These ones with one 
once tried to save him, two boats were lost, and twenty-one men, as I remember. And they put a memorial there. This affected him greatly, because he was a very good captain and looked after his men. And there they are in California, meeting the Franciscans. to be dry dock, so they're putting tar on it. And exploring a volcano. And encountering the Ainu people of the Kuril Islands. What an adventure. They've come to the peak where the volcano Stilesips departing with the chest full of information on his year-long trek across Asia and Russia to arrive in Paris. This one on the Sea of Oko. Ceremonies, taking on more provisions and sailing towards Australia. But then they stop in Samoa. Misunderstanding, or quite a big misunderstanding with the natives. La Perouse had brought some glass beads for trading, and it's unclear what exactly happened. But rocks began to be thrown, and the men, some of the men fell in the water and were clubbed to death. And I think one of them included a physician. And here, La Perouse is writing his last letter from Botany Bay in Sydney. And the ships sail away to meet their destiny. The last any European will see of this expedition. And this is what happened to De Lesseps. Delesseps crossing with all of the ship's logs and information. And he arrives in Paris, a hero. Let's have a look at the next one. This one is a bit more, um, well, shall I say, it's uh, more gritty, I think. The artwork is beautiful, though. It's all about Vanikoro. And what happened to Boussole and Astrolabe? Writing his letter. The shipwreck. The sailors are scared. Although I can imagine they're still capable because they know the sea so they're probably trying to do what they can to salvage the situation it doesn't help when there are big things with teeth coming at them from the land and sea look at that crocodile and there's La Perouse ships there, trying to 
salvage what they can after Lastrolab has found it and Pusol is sunk so they are out looking on the land to see what they can find to eat they are not finding any civilization but I doubt after all surprised. They see some skulls. So a lot of this is possibly or more likely conjecture. It makes a good story. What were the last hours like? So some are still injured from the shipwreck. And yet they're trying to see what they can save themselves. They still have a boat. And there's a native. The men seem happy at first to see the natives. And they bring their flag provisions to guard them. They don't know what's going to happen. Some of them have had their heads cut off when he sees them. This is a storms and rain. They're having a very hard time. One of the accounts from an indigenous islander uh, who was there said, fighting with these white men, and then the white men moved to another island, and after six months they went away in a canoe, and they didn't see them again. So even though they've been captive, I think some of them survived to escape, but what happened to that canoe? some archaeological epiphany occurs, or even perhaps some oral history from an island nearby reveals something. There's another man getting his head slit and a mask. They're having lots of trouble with the natives. Yeah, I told you this one was a bit it were not only being a graphic novel, it's <laughs> it looks as if they have a small fort to protect themselves. It'd be a fun story to read because I think the birds play a large part in this little story. see a British ship. This will be Edwards. The quite severe man looking for the bounty mutineers. There he sees the smoke and he thinks that can't be mutineers. 
engineers and that's all he's looking for. So the French are disheartened because the English sail away. some small subplots trading and of course women more violence erupts they just can't seem to get along the islanders and the shipwrecked sailors and there we have our bird South Seas Never will they be found There are a few instruments Some more beautiful, beautiful artwork These are some of the artifacts we saw from Numea that were left on the island and our little bird Musket balls, a cannon, a very, very beautiful ship there. There's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Thank you, my friend. voyage with me on the route of La Perouse. You ship space.